Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, BSTG, the last week in uh, January. Um, today we have a presentation by Marguerite Lantink from University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, talk is titled Milankovitch Cycles and 2.46 billion year old iron formations insights into the early Earth and Earth and Earth Moon system. Next week we have a presentation from Martin Holman. Let me just find his title. That's going to be the Barberson Barberson Greenstone Belt: A Unique Window into Paleo Paleoarchean Life. Um, so with that, Andre is going to go ahead and introduce Marguerite for us today. Marguerite, you can feel free to go ahead and share your screen and get ready there. Uh, great. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Margaret Lenting. Uh, Margaret is uh, originally from uh, uh, Holland. Uh, she did uh, her undergraduate master and PhD at Utrecht University. And uh, during uh, master de uh, degree, she started to work with Paul uh, Mason on uh, Benetine formations in South Africa, uh, immediately preceding the Great Oxidation event. And she did ion isotopes as well as geochemistry. And when she followed with a PhD on the same ion formations, but focusing on very different uh, topic, uh, she com combined high precision geochronology work with Maria Fcharova and Urs uh, Schaltiger and uh, uh, sort of um, resolution of cyclicity and finding Milankovitch cyclicity in Benetine formations at 2.5 uh, billion years ago. And uh, with this, she touched on a topic that was of interest to many sedimentologists, like at what rate uh, I information I deposited. And uh, before this work, most age constraints were from shrimp analysis, not very precise. And so it, um, with high precision analysis, she was able to get much better resolution and constraints on sedimentation rate of benetine formations. So with this, I pass it to Margaret. Thanks for the introduction. Um, let's see. Yeah, so for the sake of time, I'll just uh, uh, jump right into it. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. What did you? <laughs> we can hear you. Everything looks like it's going well. Sorry about that. Yeah. So but the my slide doesn't. Uh, oh, your slide isn't isn't okay. Then let's. Uh, now it does. Okay, good. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So on the left, you see a picture of um, Geoffrey Gorge in uh, the Virginia National Park in Western Australia, um, showing a very regular, regularly layered ancient type of marine deposit known as Benedine Formation. Um, these deposits are thought to have been precipitated from the ferruginous uh, seawaters that characterized the early Earth's oceans prior to the rise of oxygen at, at about 2.4 billion years ago. And on the background, you might distinguish three people. These are my colleague Joshua Davis, uh, my former PhD supervisor Fritz Hilgen and myself while we were there uh, for field work a couple of years ago. Um, Still having issues. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. See how it goes. So on the right, <clears throat> you see a picture of a much younger type of marine sediment. These are the tubing miles from Sicily and Italy of Pliocene age. And um, the these cycles have been, as you can see on foreground, have been linked to Milankovitch forcing, specifically the climatic precession cycle, as was demonstrated by the pioneering work of Fritz Hilgen, my PhD supervisor during his PhD over 30 years ago, working on these deposits. Um, 
Now for the next 45-ish minutes, I hope to show you that over the course of my own PhD project, we've come to conclude that the protozoic gift cycles on the left-hand side are also related to Milankovic, specifically possession. And because of their old age, they can tell us something about the past evolution of the Earth Moon system. And moreover, um, they uh, can give us some insights potentially by analogy with the strikingly similar looking cycles on the left hand side, okay. something about the paleo environmental changes that occurred in response to the Milankovitch forcing at the time when environmental conditions, specifically redox conditions, were fundamentally different uh, uh, from today or the, the more recent genotic past. So, uh, but first, briefly, what are Milankovitch cycles again? Um, Milankovitch cycles are quasi periodic changes in the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit and the tilt of the rotation axis, also called obliquity, and uh, also variations in the uh, orientation of the axis, the wobble called precession. Um, these the gravitational, uh, these variations are a result of gravitational interactions between, between Earth, the Moon, and the other planets in the solar system. Um, and the eccentricity variations occur at main periodicities of about 100 and 400,000 years. And there's also a very long 2.4 million year eccentricity cycle. Obliquity has a main period of 40,000 years and climatic precession one of about 20,000 years. And importantly, these variations, they induce uh, large amplitude changes in the seasonal and latitudinal distribution of sunlight that the Earth receives at the top of its atmosphere, whereby um, obliquity has a largest effect on high latitudes and precession and eccentricity uh, are dominant at low and intermediate level uh, latitudes. And it's important to note here that precession is the main uh, controller of the changes in uh, the seasonal uh, uh, insulation and uh, eccentricity itself has a negligible effect on total in insulation, but mainly works as amplitude modulator of the precession cycle. So um, according to the astronomical theory of paleoclimate changes, these uh, secular insulation changes um, are responsible for some of the, have, have exerted a strong control on Earth's past climate. And so this theory uh, or hypothesis was uh, posed already in the 19th century, for the Pleistocene Ice Ages by um, mainly uh, Joseph Adamar and uh, James Kroll, uh, who uh, suggested the link between changes in Earth's orbit around the Sun and the Ice Ages of the Pleistocene. Um, a major step uh, forward in the development of the astronomical theory was made by the work of Minuta Milankovic in the first decades of this 20th century, uh, who First of all, is uh, known for his uh, realizing the three main uh, types of motion that control the, the changes in insulation, called the Milankovitch cycles, and also for his uh, he provided the first precise calculations of the insulation for different latitudes back to one million years into the past, and he also correctly uh, hypothesized that minima in insulation. Summer insulation on northern hemisphere, the primary cause for the occurrence of the ice ages. But it took another uh, few decades uh, until the publication of Hazetal in 1976 for a, a definite geological proof uh, for uh, the astronomical theory of where the ice ages uh, was published. And since then, in the in, since then, both a lot of immense progress on the development of climate proxy records, as well as our understanding of the astronomical uh, variations. So more and more precise calculations have been made in the past. Uh, we, uh, this astronomical theory is now well accepted. Um, but it's not only ice ages that were controlled by Milankovitch forcing. Um, subsequent geological studies have uh, extended evidence for Milankovitch cycles deeper, uh, progressively deeper into geologic uh, 
uh, time and also to the lower latitude parts of the climate system of which these are famous examples. These are um, uh, regular alternations between organic matter and organic pool marls or shales in the Cretaceous and the Neogene of the Mediterranean region. Um, and uh, these alternations, the, the occurrence of these organic matter rich intervals has been linked to maxima in summer uh, insulation controlled by climatic precession cycle uh, during eccentricity uh, maxima. Um, uh, because as I explained before, eccentricity modulates the amplitude of precession, and so they get the, the darkest and organic matter rich layers during eccentricity maxima, forming these characteristic bundles that you see in, in the picture on the left. Um, <clears throat> and based on the geological proxy, proxy studies and modeling, we now know that these organic matter rich layers have been linked to the changes typically are typically controlled by changes in monsoonal intensity. So precession of forcing of monsoonal circulation, uh, for example, is that, for example, influences precipitation and runoff into the basin, thereby causing changes in circulation and bottom water ventilation. Um, so in sharp contrast to um, this evidence for Milankovitch cycles in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic or Phanerozoic uh, is our understanding uh, about the influence of astronomical forcing during the Precambrian. Um, <clears throat> uh, while there is no, well, we know that there is like these astronomical cycles must have also been operating in the distant past. Very little is still known about their influence uh, during the Precambrian. But there are two main reasons why we would. Uh, uh, look for them and investigate this in more detail. The first one being, of course, uh, if you want to uh, understand how astronomical forcing was uh, uh, influencing Earth's climate history, we also want to know how this works during the earliest stages of its uh, history and investigate, its, uh, the, try to answer the fundamental question how Earth, the Earth system responded to the astronomical forcing when conditions were fundamentally different from the Phenerozoic. The second reason why we would want to look for Milankovitch signals in Precambrian strata is that they might potentially give us insights into early solar system dynamics, dynamics, so they can give us information about what happened, which cannot be calculated by astronomers because of the chaotic nature of the solar system. And also, it's in particular, uh, insight into the long-term evolution of the Earth-Moon system. Um, concerning the so-called so timescale problem of the Earth-Moon system, which I will explain in the next two slides. So um, this is a schematic uh, illustration uh, showing that, so that, that due to tidal dissipation within the, mainly the ocean, but also the solid Earth, because of the gravitational pull of the Moon, the Earth is gradually slowing down uh, slow down in its actual rotation and also the moon is moving further away from us. Um, this is because of the much faster uh, spin rate of the earth uh, compared to the orbital period of the moon and which pushes ahead the tidal bulge and this uh, exerts a torque in the opposite direction of the spin and accelerates the moon into a higher orbit. Um, so since the Apollo missions we have been able to precisely measure the speed at which the moon is currently moving away from Earth with lasers, and this turned out to be 3.8 centimeters per year. Back projection of this rate, uh, however, implies a lunar origin of about one and a half billion years ago, which is clearly inconsistent with our understanding of the moon formation occurring shortly after the Earth, around four and a half billion years ago. And so to reconstruct this past long-term evolution of lunar uh, recession, um, we may look at geological estimates. Uh, people have looked at both fossil growth bands and tidal rhythmites, um, but there's uh, generally large uncertainties associated with these proxies for the tidal rhythmites, specifically the fact being that 
they are prone to periods of non-deposition in the nodes, so periods of low tidal amplitude or even erosion of subsequently deposited laminate. And therefore, an alternative and potentially more robust method is presented by the sedimentary record of Milankovitch cycles. Um, and this works as follows. Um, so we know that the procession, the periods of procession and the obliquity cycles are partly uh, uh, related to the Earth-Moon system, they arise from Earth-Moon dynamics, whereas the eccentricity variations are not related to the Earth-Moon system, they arise from planetary orbital dynamics. And this means that uh, over time, or looking further into the past, um, we expect to see a change in the ratio of the, between the periodicities of climatic precession obliquity versus eccentricity, the main eccentricity cycles, which are thought to have been relatively stable over the history of the Earth. And uh, so nowadays, precession, the ratio between precession and eccentricity is about one to five, but we expect the ratio, this ratio to be decrease in the distant past. And so by reconstructing that ratio from sedimentary successions, you might be able to calculate the past Earth-Moon distance and length of day. But it criti this critically relies on um, uh, the existence of high quality sedimentary records uh, showing Milankovitch uh, control in the, in, in the distant past. And so this is where band and eye formations come into view. First of all, because they are abundant in the Precambrian rock record. Um, and secondly, they were formed in a, a very uh, like, uh, enigmatic environment uh, compared to like the Phenerozoic, so ferruginous oceans prior to the rise of atmospheric oxygen. And we know that there is um, relatively well preserved BIF deposits from the late Archean, and a very early Paleoproterozoic. The most important reason actually to look for Milankovitch signals in uh, Banai formations is the fact that already in the late 1960s and early 70s, um, very regular uh, stratigraphic patterns have been observed in these Banai formations, specifically from the Brockmanai formation in Western Australia by Alec Trendle. Um, who in his uh, presidential address article titled Revolution and Earth History specifically uh, had, uh, speculates about a possible link with uh, changes in Earth's revolution around the sun. Um, so this has been the testing this hypothesis has been the primary objective and motivation of my PhD research and of which I will now show you the, some of the results. Um, so we started in the research, not in Western Australia, but in South Africa, focusing on the Kuruma and the information in the Kikilan West Basin. And in the Kuruma Hills, we uh, and distinguished these regular alternations in the weathering prof profile between more uh, indurated reddish round uh, intervals and more uh, weathered softer intervals that are covered with the grass here. And based on cyclostratigraphic analysis, we found that this, these alternations and also bundling patterns that you can see can be explained more or less by two cycles, a five meter and a approximately 18 meter cycle. Based on um, high precision uranium lead, uh, uh, ages that we could derive, uh, Joshua Davis uh, could uh, derive for from the drill core through the Kuruman. We would could uh, were able to establish a deposition rate of BIF for the first time, which turned out to be about 10 meters per million year, and this uh, was consistent, extremely well consistent with the hypothesis that the basic five meter cycle that you see here is related to the stable long eccentricity cycle of Earth's orbit. And we, in this article, we uh, attributed the longer period cycle responsible for the bundling uh, to a 1.4 million year eccentricity cycle, which is equivalent to the present day 2.4 million year cycle that I mentioned in the beginning. 
since we know that this cycle is unstable and due to chaos can be significantly reduced in period to, down to 1.2 million years. So the, the strong of long period eccentricity cycles in the Kuruman uh, Panama formation uh, made us uh, conclude at the time that precession was the primary uh, controller of the changes of the, the, the changes in the diff environments and climate at the time where these uh, sediments were deposited. Because uh, as you re may recall, precession has a, is the primary um, control of the, the, the changes in uh, insulation and electricity is the amplitude, amplitude modulator of that. Um, so this means that if we could find, uh, look at precession and also the expression of short eccentricity in these rocks, we could potentially constrain uh, past earth moon dynamics. Um, but unfortunately in the Kuruman banana information, uh, such a clear precession and short eccentricity imprint was not observed unfortunately, so we had to look for other intervals uh, where, this, uh, where this could have been uh, better expressed. So for this purpose, we moved to Western Australia, uh, focusing on the more or less time equivalent Brockman Iron Formation, and specifically looking at the Joffre member of the Brockman Iron Formation, which is uh, well uh, exposed in the Gorges of Joffre Gorge in Karajini National Park. And so at the Joffre Falls section, we uh, found this uh, beautifully uh, regularly, uh, regular alternations again in weathering profile between uh, uh, reddish brown biff and softer shaly carbonaceous intervals that are more weathered away at the approximate thickness scale of about 85 centimeters. Um, when we zoom in, uh, take a closer look at the rocks. Again, you see here the basic 85 centimeter alternations uh, uh, indicated with the horizontal bars, but you can also see modulations in the, uh, the thickness of the, the more weathered intervals or the, the darker shadow uh, at the longer, suggesting a longer period a variation of about three and a half meters thickness. And based on this approximately one to four thickness ratio in these two cycles, and based on the thickness in general, thinking back of the uranium lead ages of the Kuruman, we hypothesized that these alternations are related to short and long eccentricity. Um, look, taking an even closer look at the rocks, we distinguish the smaller scale, even smaller scale variations of about 10 centimeters thickness. And if since, uh, if the larger scale variations were indeed controlled by eccentricity, these smaller scale variations are most likely uh, to be the reflection of the climatic precession cycle. Um, so you can see on the left, the, the cycles are the most regularly expressed there, where you can, uh, they're, they're defined by alternation between a double white bed and a red or blue chip. <clears throat> um, so to test our Melanchthon hypothesis for each rough member, we did some rigorous cyclosolographic testing and spectral uh, analysis, um, confirming the the two main skills of cyclicity that we had ob observed and I just um, introduced before. And we did again uranium high precision uranium lead dating of a drill core uh, that was located 150 kilometers to the west of Joffre Falls, producing the following ages and the following deposition rate model, uh, giving a very, well, essentially uh, the same deposition rate as for the Kuruman previously, between five and 50 meters per million year. And so this rate is consistent, was thought to be consistent with our Milankovitch interpretation that these medium and large scale variations are short and long eccentricity, and meaning that these smaller scale variations are related to climatic precession. Um, now, based on um, uh, the ratio between short eccentricity, so the 85 centimeter, and uh, the smaller scale ones, uh, we could establish a period of precession 
So we established a ratio of about one to nine. So we counted on average about nine climatic precession related cycles per, per eccentricity, 100,000 year eccentricity cycle. And this allowed us to estimate a precession period of about 11,000 years. Um, we can, the details are all provided in the article in PNES. And um, uh, this allowed us to recalculate uh, an estimate for the Earth Moon distance uh, 2.46 billion years ago. And this is shown here. So, this is um, a figure from Farhad et al., which is publication that <clears throat> was, oh, this article was published at the same time as the, our, our, uh, our uh, article for the Joffre member. And so in this model study, they pre present a much improved model for the long-term evolution of the Earth Moon system. And our data point uh, turned out to plot exactly on their curve, although the, it was the made totally independent from the, the, the model. And so this is all very exciting. Uh, this provides now uh, the, the most reliable, the oldest reliable reconstruction of the Earth Moon distance um, based on cyclostratigraphy. And uh, of course, this is not the end of the story because now we need to uh, also explore other intervals along this curve to see whether to, to better constrain this suggested uh, evolution of the Earth Moon distance over time. Um, okay. On to the final part of the talk, um, and that is about the paleo-environmental paleo significance of the, <clears throat> the precession cycles that we, uh, uh, we see in the, in the Joffre diff. Um, so um, this is, uh, um, so what, what, so actually essentially question, what were the, were the, the, the what was the paleo-environmental paleo, paleo changes in response to the precession of forcing in this protrozoic diff setting. And so to address this very important, but also very difficult question, um, we may turn back to this comparison <clears throat> between the, with the, the cycles in the Pliocene, the very similar looking cycles in the Pliocene. Um, maybe we can learn something about uh, our knowledge about the formation of those uh, <clears throat> uh, and translate that to the, 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 the protrusive gift cycles. So uh, again, the, the alternations in the Pliocene have been explained by uh, peri periods of uh, increased organic matter input, which are represented by the grayish layers in between the double white bands, um, uh, links to changes in uh, monsoon strength, um, where specifically the African monsoon periodically uh, had a larger discharge, thereby stopping the circulation in, in, in the Mediterranean basin mm -hmm. and also increasing productivity. Uh, and so this increased production of organic matter and preservation of organic matter led to the deposition of these organic matter rich intervals. But it's not only changes in organic matter, it's also these triggered Major redox changes in the uh, condition, redox conditions of the bottom waters and also pore waters of the sediment, um, as shown by ge subsequent geochemical uh, re uh, research. And uh, specifically in the study by Van Hoof, all they concentrate on these sharp enrichments in redox sensitive elements of iron and manganese and sulfide, um, which uh, represent discrete mineral precipitation, uh, mineral horizons of magnetites and manganese oxides and iron sulfides that are interpreted as of early diagenetic origin and were preserved on geologic time steels due to non-steady state diagenesis due to sharp uh, gradients in the organic matter content of the sediment and or organic matter influx to this seabed. Um, so to also uh, look a bit more closely into the lithology and potential redox chemistry of the um, BIF cycles, we 
we uh, selected a number of drill core intervals from the same core that was targeted for uranium lead. Uh, uh, here, by the way, the, the cycles are have a bit of a different structure than the ones in the field. So here they are uh, defined by a, a regular intercalation, intercalation of um, this greenish brown mudrock intervals, which are also a bit more clay rich, which are surrounded by this, this uh, iron oxide rich bands. And so XRF core scanning of uh, these cores produced the following records. Um, showing very similar patterns in uh, speci especially uh, silver, also iron. And so you see it again, it's a sharp and often double peaks in sulfide, which occurs at the, uh, which are bounded by um, uh, more subtle, uh, smaller peaks in iron, which represent magnetite layers. And so these sulfide peaks represent distinct uh, discrete um, pyrite layers. Um, and so the sharpness of the layers and the occurrence of double uh, layers and also the symmetry with the iron made us uh, that the interpretation that these are probably also of early diagenetic origin and would also be related to changes in organic matter deposition. Um, but then in a, in, a, in, a, in like in a diff setting, so which has totally different redox boundary conditions than for, during the Pliocene. So um, specifically the, 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 the double sulfide peaks and their position with respect to the iron profiles uh, made us to make, hypothesize that these represent the periodic buildup of hydrogen sulfide during uh, early diagenesis, at some stage during burial or deposition. Uh, and, uh, this hydrogen sulfide reacted with up and downward diffusion dissolved iron uh, to create two uh, precipitation fronts for uh, iron sulfides. And also uh, you get magnetite enrichments just on the outside of that to where you have intermediate organic matter uh, content of the sediment. Uh, and therefore pre preferential reaction of iron with the very hydride substrate. So I forgot to mention, so the hydrogen sulfide buildup is due to the breakdown of organic matter with sulfate, via sulfate reduction. So this has been described by these uh, uh, studies from Bernard and Passier et al. But we wanted to test using a, a reactive transport model um, whether and how such uh, Eryzogenetic patterns could be formed in an early Proterozoic BIF environment where, uh, where the boundary redox conditions were fundamentally different, so no oxygen, um, where ferry hydride was probably the, the major um, uh, oxidant arriving at the seabed, and also was characterized by very low. Uh, by high the uh, soft iron content of the water column and also very low sulfate concentrations because of the anoxic atmosphere. Um, so I'll now walk you through the reactive transport model that we made. So on the top you see our input scenario for organic matter to the sediment water interface uh, modeled over two precession uh, cycles. Um, so organic matter goes up for a period of about uh, four kilo year, about one third of the duration of one precession cycle. Um, and then so here below, I now plot the um, corresponding solid phase and solute uh, pore water profiles um, uh, for the model. Um, so note that we use a sulfate concentration of the bottom water surface, very low, but consistent with the literature, what li literature says about uh, the sulfate concentrations of the seawater prior to the GOE. And um, we then uh, imposed the uh, following um, input scenario of iron oxides or ferry hydride. Um, 
and also bottom water iron. So you see that it's high during the phase of low organic matter input, and then we impose the strong decline in both the flux of ferrohydrite and bottom water iron concentrations to almost zero during the peak in organic matter phase. And so um, I will show in a minute uh, that we had to do that this to, this is found out by trial and error, to be able to reproduce the characteristic XRF-based uh, elemental profiles of the Joffre member um, procession cycles. And so I'll just now walk you through the model. So the black arrow indicates where we are in time. So now we are where iron has goes down and organic matter has already gone up. And so you see a start to build up, build up of hydrogen sulfide. Um, which is only possible to, by, by uh, lowering the input of iron. Otherwise, uh, this immediately react the, the small amounts of hydrogen sulfide that are formed are immediately reacted away uh, uh, with the iron, the available iron. And so this is during the peak of the organic matter phase, and you see already the, um, the lower uh, sulfide peak forming. Uh, so this would be uh, iron, mono, uh, sulfide, and also pyrite. And then this is at the end where organic matter has gone down again, and you see a second iron, iron sulfide peak form, forming, which occurs on the inside of the small magnet, magnetite enrichments that we are also able to model. So um, based on this, uh, data model comparison, uh, we have come up with the following conceptual model uh, for the origin of the precession-related cycles in a Joffre member. And specifically, because of this strong decoupling in the organic matter and the iron that was needed, was essential to be able to reproduce the characteristic double sulfide peaks, which we interpret as a result of buildup of hydrogen sulfide within the organic matter rich layer and can only be achieved when there's not enough, not, not that much iron around, uh, only at the top and the bottom. Um, we um, suggest that these changes in organic matter and periodic increase in organic matter over the possession cycle and the decline in iron concentrations of the overlying water column uh, in terms of changes in um, large amplitude changes in the position of the iron chemoclein line in the water column that were controlled by changes in oxygen production from oxygenic photosynthesis. Um, so this is the only way to explain the strong decoupling. So this cannot be explained by um, unoxygenic photoferrotrophs. And so to link these changes in organic matter deposition and iron chemocline position over possession in the water column on a possession cycle to a climatic phenomenon, thinking back of our models for the Pliocene Mediterranean cycles, we suggest that the, this was controlled by changes in monsoonal intensity, which periodically uh, provided a larger uh, influx of nutrients through runoff, uh, thereby stimulating organic matter um, for productivity, but also oxygen production, moving the chemo down. And um, so these, this is not very really interesting uh, for our understanding potentially uh, about astronomical, astronomical climate forcing of the anoxic or pre-GOE world. Uh, this is potentially also um, uh, important for understanding of the, the redox evolution or oxygenation history of the, 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 um, the, oce the Earth's oceanic margins in that prelude to the GOE. And so based on the, the, the dynamical changes that we, we interpret to see in the precession cycles, we, suggest or propose that this 
uh, oxygenation history or redox history even may have, might have even been much more dynamic than we now maybe appreciate from ge the ge ge geological record. So we know of all these whiffs, but their timing and causes are fully constrained. And so this uh, Melankovitch di dimension is, I think, very interesting. And it would also suggest that, yeah, the shift from this scenario to this one, uh, the change in the redox structure of the oceanic margins, which have been much more dynamic or as dynamic on Malankovitch time scales than over like the, the, the general long-term trend. And so this brings me to the conclusions of the talk. Uh, so first of all, I hope I have convinced you that there's Malankovitch cyclicity visible in early paleo prototype BIFs from South Africa and Western Australia. Uh, I've shown you that based on the ratio between precession and eccentricity, we can uh, obtain an estimate of past earth moon distance and earth moon dynamics. Um, and thirdly, modeling of the early diagenetic sulfur and iron patterns in the BIF cycles of the trough member uh, they suggest periodic changes in organic matter deposition coupled with uh, iron chemocline changes. And we suggest that these are called, uh, caused by processional forcing of oxygenic photosynthesis activity by a change in monsoonal intensity prior to the great oxidation event. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank you. And I take any questions. <laughs> thank you, Marguerite. That was really good. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and start our question and discussion portion. And you can ask questions in a couple of ways either by typing into the chat and I can ask it for you, or you can locate the raise hand button at the bottom. So you go down to the bottom and you find reactions, click the reactions button and raise hand is right at the bottom of that pop-up. So let's go ahead and um, get started with questions. Uh, I had a question, um, Marguerite, I was wondering uh, about, so the the ultimate link to at the end there to the changes in the environment with increased runoff um, and increased nutrients is that something that we've been able to trace or pe people have previously traced in younger cyclicity um, signatures like the rhythmites is it due to increased runoff um, or yeah so so there are multiple uh, so we observe these. Uh, periodic ep episodes of bottom water oxygen depletion in the Mediterranean New Gene and in the Cretaceous and other intervals in the Phenerozoic, and they have been generally linked to changes in monsoonal intensity. But this this can go via a number of ways. This can one example is yeah by changing uh, runoff, uh, but also this could also be changing ocean circulation, upwelling patterns. Uh, mm. stuff like that. So there's a uh, many different explanations for that, and so but the reason that we're, why we make the link with monsoon is because we are know we're at the low latitudes probably uh, during the position of the Joffrey, and we see a strong precession and eccentricity control. So this is by, for now the most logical uh, model that we have, and so yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Eva Stoiken had her hand raised next. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so also, so the, there's some in, and there's evidence from the modern ocean that hydrothermal vents also responding to tides. And so I was wondering if there's any if there's any anything known about if they also respond to these Milankovitch cycles and if you could have maybe stronger hydrothermal iron input or something like that during certain um, periods. Yeah, so um, so the pressure, precession skill variations are uh, of course something different from um, the, the tidal, the how the like the effect of the tides on hydrothermal uh, potential uh, potential effects of the tides on hydrothermal fan activity because it's on different time scales. So for now, I've been talking about precession time scales, but um, I, I'm not really <laughs> I don't really know a lot about this specifically. Uh, I would guess that uh, given the 
the model and all the knowledge that we have from the Phanerozoic, how we generally explain these changes in <clears throat> organic matter preservation and redox, bottom water redox conditions, that's ultimately related to climate. Uh, it's for me straightforward. That's the first the, the hypothesis we should explore also for the Paleoproterozoic. And so, of course, there could be a hydrothermal effect, but I, I, I also don't really know if the moon was closer, whether that would have really have a, a much larger effect on, for example, that. So it's a question, matter of what's the most dominant process, I guess. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. I don't know either. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Linda has, was, had their hand raised next. Yeah. Great. What a, that was a wonderful talk, and I'm so glad to see the uh, the reactive transport model uh, bring something to bear on the on the story of the double peaks in particular, which is something that uh, I think has been a puzzle for a lot of us uh, for a long time. So I just wanted to reiterate that the the interpretation or the analysis that brought you to uh, to find that the precession is given the precession cycles have a period that is uh, largely expected from uh, the models that we have about tidal dissipation back through Earth history to give us these, you know, these rapid, you know, the 15,000 year cycles instead of 20 to 24,000 years is really, a, you know, a testament to the, the uh, just the, the great section that you found in the Joffrey. So I wanted to, uh, compliment you again on that. It was really uh, a great uh, outcome. And then finally, you know that you you have you have compared the your results about the precession, the precession constant which leads you to can lead one through modeling with physics to uh, obtain a earth moon distance and a length of day as a matter of fact uh, uh, as well. That the willy -wally, the willy wally formation, which occurs right above the Joffrey, uh, has been analyzed as a tidalite. So a tidalite meaning that uh, the uh, the fine laminations that are observed there uh, can be uh, interpreted as as uh, influence from the lunar tidal cycles, and it might be worthwhile to go back and try to uh, to reduce those large uh, uncertainties that that are have been reported in the past for the Willy Wally uh, tidalite, and just to, and you you yourself found the new paper by uh, George Williams that just came out a few months ago, uh, looking as if perhaps there can be a a, a reanalysis of those of that tidalite. Uh, to see how close it comes to your interpretation for the procession, because the two should should give us similar results, but yes. completely yeah. completely yeah. independent time scales. Yeah, yeah. So that would be great. Um, I'm I'm just I, I'm a little cautious about the Willy Wally particular, and so even though now we have some good constraints on, on sedimentation rate and what is the thickness of precession in the Joffre mean. Joffre member doesn't mean necessarily that we then now also know this, have more knowledge for the Willy Wally. Um, so I guess we should test this again with uranium lead dating and also, um, well, based on, on George Williams' interpretations, the, the precession rate will be much higher there which could be, uh, but also, yeah, if you, as soon as you go to the sub Milankovic time skills, there are so many periodicities and it's even more difficult to be really convinced about your interpretation of the cycle patterns because, yeah, and, and, also, and then and again, also the, the problem of like non-deposition, as I mentioned for tidal systems in general, but yeah. Um, so it would be very, <laughs> would be perfect if we could get like some reliable estimate from that, but uh, we have to also be very careful, I guess, yeah. Thank you, Martin. 
Sorry, uh, Ber uh, Bertus is up next. Uh, sorry, it's a bit dark here. I'm sitting in South Africa and they're intermittently switching off our electricity at the moment. Um, Margriet, great talk, super interesting. Um, I wanted to know uh, with your interpretation on the, uh, uh, just to check, you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, so luckily they haven't uh, they haven't managed to switch off my microphone, but just the electricity. So, um, with regards to the Milankovic cycles and and uh, your interpretation of variable monsoon intensities, um, to what extent? Because I'm, and then that's related to continental runoff, correct, into the ocean. Yeah, that's yeah our first order interpretation at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So, so to what extent would that depth-wise and lateral distance from the coast-wise have an influence on your ocean? Um, do they know in these modern environments to what extent laterally and depth-wise the variable monsoon runoff can influence ocean well, so water bodies? You know that, that I, I explained. Uh, the, so the example of the Mediterranean basin. So there, so that yes. that's a typical size, but also for the Cretaceous. But that's not only runoff, I guess, that's a number of other factors occurring as well. But there, I mean, the, the, there the, we see uh, for over large, much larger areas, but that's, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what specific transact of the continental margin, if there was any, we are now looking at, if we look at these Joffre member uh, BIF deposits, but at least for a relatively small size of the basin, what we think we're looking at for the South African and Western Australian BIFs, I think is really feasible to think of such a like a, a effect. And also the fact that, yeah, we see this in green layers, which are more clay rich. So yeah, they suggest some terrigenous inputs and, uh, it makes sense that they coincide with the interpreted interval of higher organic matter input. Mm. That's okay. So, so essentially, yeah, so you can see it affecting what could have been the entire Volbora craton. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Uh, Axel is up next. Uh, Axel, unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Look, I'm also sitting in South Africa, but it's not all dark and gloomy because I do have light in my office. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I worked uh, 20 years ago on a section of carbonates uh, in Zimbabwe where I observed some cyclostratigraphy and uh, also interpreted those cycles uh, with uh, Milankovic orbital forcing. So, I mean, I did spend a lot of time in the field, so I would like to kind of know how my findings do uh, correspond to your findings. Did it make, or does it make sense what I did uh, 20 years ago, or, or should I go back to the field? <laughs> no, it definitely does seem to make sense. I, if I recall correctly, you uh, find a 9.6 smaller scale cycles for one yeah, large scale cycle, yeah, and I find yeah. approximately nine or eight point nine to me more precisely. So that means, so this is older two point six five, yeah. 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 So it right. makes sense. So that would be an even shorter precession period. So that okay. makes perfectly sense. Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. that's good. good to hear. We have now a better age for the Cheshire formations. Ah, okay. I was deposited around two point seven three. So. Maybe I need to have a look again and see how this may affect uh, the cyclicity. But I'm yeah, you should you should try to do it. Yeah. 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 But I'm, I'm glad to hear that all the months that I spent in the field logging this carbonate section, uh, in the end, turned out to be kind of correct according to yeah. what you. Well, I did. mean, still, I mean, consistency doesn't mean that we're sure. <laughs> it doesn't tell us yet yeah. that it's correct, but also like we do this almost perfect agreement with the. Model of Mohammed Farah that all is could still be a coincidence, but it is an interesting starting point for further analysis. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. All right, Andrea, you're up next. Uh, hi, my, Margaret. Uh, great talk. Uh, I was just um, wondering. So 
by comparing to Pleistocene deposits, you sort of implying that we're kind of where uh, deep water drivers were probably less important in cyclicity, but uh, uh, but um, sort of what was happening in the surface environment was driving cyclicity. Did you try to look at it from a perspective that um, release of iron and uh, submarine volcanic activity would also have control? So for example, like emplacement of Lachignis provinces would uh, result in sea level rise and when sea level falls so, so it could be like a deep water control over over this process as well and um, so from this perspective like organic rich layers could be periods when a submarine uh, activity dies out or decreased so that's one question, and it leads to, uh, so, so is it possible that uh, layering in a way, and you kind of hinted towards it, represent diagenetic kind of uh, effects. So you basically you have deposition of fine formation and when surface conditions drive um, diagenetic reaction, which produce this uh, periodicity that you measured. And other question, um, so you you have high precision analysis and you measure sedimentation rate, but in a way it's probably minimum sedimentation rate because uh, because you could have a gaps in sedimentary record like Sadler sort of talks about. So uh, uh, did you think is there any way to reach kind of a, on a shorter scale? resolution to to get a sedimentation rate for our information so, uh, sorry too many questions yeah okay so about the last one so yeah what we do with the uranium lead we have average sedimentation rate over that interval mm -hmm. for different horizons um that doesn't indeed mean that if you look at shorter intervals that uh there was a larger sedimentation rate, but then on average over the precession uh, uh, or Milankovitch feed cycles, uh, this sort of uh, makes sense in with the uranium lead ages. But um, so it's also actually uh, relates back to Linda's question about the willy wally. So I'm a bit worried that if you, if you look go look at finer scales and start to say, okay, this might be tidalite. Uh, tidal rhythmite deposits, it's it's more difficult to know at what sedimentation rate we're looking at if you zoom on in on, on, on those finer scales. And then, so um, uh, your first question was uh, influence of hydrothermal activity, uh, a bit similar to what Eva uh, asked. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this could all uh, have had an influence, I think, but I don't know. And also I think, but I try to, um, so because these Bennett R formations are some, they're also really always really related to this hydrothermal influx because that's the, the, the source of partially the source of the iron and the silica and, and so on. But uh, I don't think, based on the fact that we see these climatic signals preserved in them in some intervals, that we maybe we should think of them, them more as like normal marine pel pelagic uh, sediments or mar continental margin sediments. And so that's why I make this whole analogy with the, the Pliocene or Neogene uh, equivalence to to try and learn more about that potentially and look at also look at those deposits more in such a way rather that yeah so i cannot of course there could have been change in hydrothermal activity but you don't expect these to be cyclical and so uh yeah <laughs> um, so, so could I, I, the cyclicity be sort of superimposed like your like your modeling of diagenesis could it so in a way could uh, cyclicity be Milankovitch cycles 
uh, superimposed during diagenesis? Um, yeah, but so what's, so the diagenesis I'm talking about is early diagenetic. And yeah. so what, I mean, if you see uh, changes in mythology uh, that you can link to Melanchthon's cycles, there must have been some primary cause for that. And I think that the, the most logical explanation is there a change, there was a change in some type of sediment supply triggering then the diagenesis. And then regardless of how that exactly worked, it's now leading to this uh, astronomical signal. And I think that the changes in organic matter input are a very uh, logical uh, explanation for that. So yeah, I don't know whether that really answers your question, but yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, Paul, you had your hand up, but you're good now. I'm gonna uh, defer to Christoph for now, but you can come back to me. Okay, all right, Christoph. Yeah, hi, Margaret, uh, a great talk. And uh, just a comment, uh, you come to the um, down to earth moon distance from, from analyzing the ratio of, of Milankovitch cycles. And we in the Moody's group come at, at, at the same question from, <clears throat> from the analysis of tidal bundles uh, 700 million years earlier, 3.2, and the results fit very well. Uh, we, we also calculate an earth moon distance of about 70%, 63 to 75, with a day length of about 13 hours. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm well aware of your work. Data. Is it already published? Because it was a preprint, I know. Yes, but... it's uh, Eulenfeld and Holbeck in, in JGR planets. Okay, Just congratulations. Two, two yeah. Old. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah. So also to mention, yeah, so the, the in the plot that they showed, I showed the, not your estimate. So there was one estimate of, uh, from the Moody's, but that's of, from of Ericsson and Simpson, yeah, of two thousand. Yeah, but that's not correct. But, By the yeah. way, Paul, yeah, your PhD supervisor is looking at the the Moody's course as we speak. Yeah, we started generating the reference data set on Monday. Okay, good to hear. Yeah, thanks. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, hi, Margaret. Uh, hi. I don't really have a question. I just want to make a prediction which is that um, your PNAS paper will be cited uh, long after any paper I've written has been forgotten. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> All right, we don't have any more hands, uh, but uh, we can just open to general discussion. Um, I'm, I'd be happy to ask another. Um, I'm wondering what you think is next uh, to maybe test your hypothesis of the of the um, in the the changes in weathering regime, or did you collect for uh, samples for chemical analysis? What do you think is the next step? Yeah, so more detail to chemical analysis. Um, I also didn't show all the like geochemical, but we we have a lot of more data, but it still needs to be published. Um, uh, but I can say we also have some exciting phosphorus data um, that could be linked to also the changes in the productivity uh, would fit nicely with that model. Um, yeah, and then I mean, uh, uh, in general, I think understanding, making a more Comprehensive model for uh, the, the the how the astronomical forcing was changing the regional climate uh, within the whole basin. So now we look at one drill core. We should look also for maybe other lateral positions, or it can also be both in laterally or horizontally. It doesn't really matter. But um, so look at a whole range of because it, you, there was a lot of uh, a lot of different varieties in the in the, the specific lithological characteristics of the precession signal that we interpret. So already you saw the large difference in the drill core cycles and the ones in the field. So these are all things that we should, yeah, uh, study and um, 
but I mean, I, I need to first get like funding for that. So that's just another. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm sort I'm of hoping, wondering. Yeah. Oh, I was just sort of wondering if you think oxygen isotopes are a good move. Do you, could we use that in a similar way that's used yeah. for so more? We did, we did measure. So we did measure carbon isotopes. They, these are interesting uh, specifically for, uh, yeah, so to reconstruct um, carbon cycling organic matter variations, but, and also diagenesis and oxygen isotopes. Um, from what I recall, uh, yeah, they are a little bit more sensitive, susceptible to, yeah, metamorphic overprinting. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, yes, this uh, start and, I mean, yeah, uh, this uh, probably will take dec decades to <laughs> do all the analysis. Yeah, that's a me. lot of work. Okay, Linda, go ahead. Sorry. I had another uh, question about the 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 small clay rich intervals in between the the two uh, yeah. the two peaks. Uh, what kinds of clays are in there, or do you think they're too diagenetic to make any interpretation? Well, mostly, so it's still normal lane, uh, typical. For Biff and um, but they also yeah so they the uh, they're actually very carbonate rich and um, but we also <laughs> uh, how carbonate need, rich yeah uh, but well yeah I need to look more in uh, look into that as well it's just also the crushing of the rocks is a bit <laughs> has been um, okay some challenge also because there's a bit of asbestos in it so this is post all kinds of challenges but anyway yeah. Um, but typical, if I recall, typical clay minerals in this, uh, so potassium and aluminium bearing, uh, producing, um, I didn't show the XRF profiles, but you see huge peaks in aluminium, potassium, rubidium, they're corresponding to those uh, major layers. Okay, thank you. Okay, good, Daryl. Yeah, there's a lot of implications in your work, which are really interesting, particularly when you look at the length of day. When it gets so short, this has got to have major effects on distribution of climate zones and consequently the uh, distribution of facies belts elsewhere. So when we come to reconstructing past, um, checking past paleomag, using uh, facies, we're running into problems. I think not really much of a question, but you know, it's a, it's a research project for all of you guys to do, to try and tie this down. I'm, does the reduction in size of the Hadley cells, for example, uh, have much impact on distribution of facies? Yeah, so that's a very good comment, yeah. So also I didn't tell, but so the length of data we reconstruct estimates from the precession frequency, that, that's the, actually the only observable that we measure. And then we can estimate from that earth moon distance and length of day, and it's about 16.9 hours at 2.46 billion years ago. Yeah, I've been thinking about it. Yeah, so change in the rotational speed affecting the number really of Hadley cells even. It's just, that's, it poses a lot of interesting questions, but. <laughs> I'm a bit worried that uh, there's not that much rock record preserved. So we'll, <laughs> I guess we have to collaborate with a lot of good modelers, I guess. Um, yeah. Also, uh, there are some studies that suggest a link with uh, the day length the and its effect on the, the bio biology. Uh, so also production of oxygen, and there have even been speculations about a link between like the boring billion of uh, relatively stable uh, atmospheric oxygen and some uh, like uh, uh, periods of constant day length because of the atmospheric thermal tide. So the, this is like a paper by Kla et al. It's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, whatever. Thank you. So, uh, Mag Margaret, uh, did you try to uh, look 
um, and I guess there are not enough high precision ages, but if you plot um, sort of estimates from different studies versus uh, thickness of the interval over which we measured uh, sedimentation rate for iron formation, do you see any increase in sedimentation rate as you go sort of as you calculate between two ages that are closer to each other and uh, it would be really interesting to find uh, sort of two ash beds that are close enough to each other that uh, precision would not be a problem and yet uh, close enough that uh, you have less average in over sedimentation rate. So do you have any comments on it? I think they will be difficult. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you want uh, like uh, less than 400,000 year position, for example, and then you have two. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, I think um, I think for now the 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 the, the consistency with the we have for both the Kuruman and for the Joffre member we have four different horizons within an interval of 200 meters or so that where the ages all follow stratigraphic order they become younger with stratigraphic order and the cycle patterns that we see within the stratigraphy are consistent with a Milankovitch origin. And so, even though there were on shorter uh, depth intervals, there were intervals maybe of non deposition or large change sedimentation, still during a certain portion of the precession cycle, there was deposition uh, of the BIF and there was deposition of the more clay rich intervals. And so, that has uh, left its signature in the stratigraphy such that you can see that astronomical signature. So um, I don't see uh, why we would like really try to pin this even further down with radium lead because also I think that's just maybe asking a bit too much from the, <laughs> but I mean it's still worth um, proceeding also in that way. Thank you. All right. Well, it seems like we've asked you a whole lot of questions. And considering the number of questions, I'm surprised it's still before quarter after nine. So um, you got a lot done in an hour 15. So uh, really cool stuff. I was really, really happy to have you present, Marguerite. Um, so uh, big thanks to me and everybody here. And yeah. Yeah. OK. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.